Unit 4, Research Methods. Section 1, Validity and Reliability. Okay, so today's screencast is concerned with external validity. And in particular, we're going to discuss what it is, why it is important, and then ultimately, what that means. You know, is it bad? Okay, so we've already discussed before um, a, uh, an example study, and this particular one obviously is looking at the effect of creatine with sprinting performance. So imagine that researchers did uh, the, a group of subjects and they all got them, they got them all to do the 30 meter sprint test. They then did four weeks of training taking the supplement creatine and then tested them again to see if they had improved. And the researchers found no improvement. So what we need to ask ourselves really as good researchers is we need to question the external validity of our study. And what this really means is how much of the results that we have found can we generalize to the real world? So if we found no improvement with creatine with our subjects, does that mean that every single person in the world doing every single type of exercise would not benefit from creatine? So it's all about the conclusion that we can draw. So this is, this is what we mean by being externally valid. Is it valid to the external world? Here's a, another definition of external validity, and essentially it's, it's you know, trying to emphasize the same point. To what degree or how much of the results that we've found do they actually apply to the real world? Okay, so let's go back to the study. Um, we tested a group of subjects. Now, that group of subjects are what we call a sample. So we can't test every single person in the, in the world. Uh, with creatine and doing the sprinting. So we've, we've taken a small sample. Let's say we took 10 people. So if we're looking at a population, uh, for perhaps the UK, we need to take a small sample or a small representation of the UK. So in this particular case here, you can see we've got a small group of people, but we've got a whole range of different ethnicities, ages, heights, etc. So that's quite a mixed sample, and that probably represents uh, the UK very well. Um, as opposed to having you know, 10 sports science students. So the, one of the questions we have with sampling is, if we take a sample, how well does our sample match the population? This sample looks like it's got quite a lot of, uh, a big mix, but are the ratios of ethnicities and ages and heights, are they the same as what you would get in the average UK uh, population? So this is where we start to argue how externally valid is our study. With sampling, we need to ensure that we have a good sample, one that is externally valid and represents the population that we are dealing with. And we also talk about threats. So is there anything that could threaten how good our sample is? Well, one way of doing this with sampling is rather than just taking a random sample, we can do something called stratified sampling. Now, what this means is we deliberately select people. So, for example, rather than just taking 10 random people from the UK population, what we could do is take three people aged 18 to 25, three people aged 26 to 40, three people aged 41 to 55, and three people aged 56 to 70. And what we've done there is guaranteed ourselves a good spread, rather than just selecting 10 people and maybe not getting anyone aged 56 to 70, because it's random. So stratified sampling allows us to do that. Another thing that we would need to ensure with sampling is just the bigger the better. The more subjects we have, the more chance we have of getting a broader range uh, of the population. Okay, so now we're going to quickly discuss some other problems that we get with external validity. And one of those, uh, highlighted by Campbell, is the principle of proximal similarity. Now this might sound a complicated theory, but it really isn't. What it means is, how similar is your study to the real life? So it's asking yourself, the way you set your experiment up, how similar is that to the real world? And that will tell you how externally valid it is. Okay, so here's an example. You've got your subjects, and you want to know how well your subjects relate to the real world. Well, for example, if you've just used the England football team as your group of subjects, of course, how well does that relate to real people in the real world? Well, of course, it doesn't. So if you've used the England football team, it's not very externally valid because it doesn't relate much to the real world. They are uh, high-level athletes um, and, and obviously superior skilled when it comes to 
However, it's it's also worth considering that if you've used the England football team as your subjects and you want your study to not relate to the real world as such, but you want it to relate to elite footballers, uh, then you actually do have uh, good external validity. Okay, so another key threat is the setting or the environment that you've used to do your study. So again, the environment must match the world or the real world or the world that you're trying to, uh, to, to understand. So again, if you do your testing in a laboratory, then your results really only apply to laboratory studies. So for example, if you do some work looking at middle distance running, but you've done it in a lab, it doesn't relate to real life middle distance running, and so therefore it wouldn't relate to someone like Mo Farah. Um, so that's not so good. If you were to do the study in a lab, uh, and you wanted to relate it to more lab-based work, then that would be absolutely fine. So the key thing is that your setting must match the world that you are, or the population that you're trying to study. Uh, okay, so the last bit with external validity. Researchers must understand the external validity of their project. Um, if you understand your own external validity, uh, then you can be critical of your own research and also you can be critical of previous research by other people. And by identifying their external validity, you can be critical uh, and potentially find a gap which you can obviously uh, exploit. So we can rate a study's external validity. Um, if a study, so your own or someone else's, if they have made the conditions and the subjects very relevant to real people, then it has high external validity. If the study is not relevant to the real world and uh, it's not relevant to, to sort of real life and, real, and most people, then it has very low external validity. So we really have sort of you know a high or low. Does is it related or is it not? And of course you know it might be a grey area. Some areas may be more related and some areas might not. But the key question, this is what confuses most people, is that low external validity, is it bad? Well, no, it's not. Ultimately, if you want to do a, an experiment using a very small group of subjects, so for, uh, for example, elite footballers or sports science students, a very small population, if you want to do that, you're going to have low external validity. But that's fine, because what it means is those results will only apply to those particular people. And if that's what you want, that's fine. So, in conclusion, um, external validity is, is really understanding how our study relates to the real world, or who the research actually relates to. This allows us to make sure we draw the right conclusions. You do see studies that conduct their research using elite athletes, and then might uh, use those same results and conclusions and say that they apply to the real world. And of course, external validity says that they don't. They only apply to the conditions and the people that you have used. Um, this is a really good way of uh, helping us identify where there's gaps. So if research has done lots of re uh, studies on um, elite athletes and nothing on uh, normal people, then obviously we've got ourselves a gap and we can use that to try and create our own research study.